I first began my journey through the system when I was about 13 years old. Admittedly, my behaviour at home was not great and my mum and I were locked in a cycle of bad behaviour, rules, punishment and rebellion. I don't feel I had a close relationship with my mum. It seemed the more I misbehaved, the more I was punished emotionally. This resulted in me further rebelling to the point where our relationship broke down. Although I think my mum had contacted social services because I suppose she felt she couldn't cope, I wasn't placed in foster care but with my auntie and uncle. This was okay to begin with, but even though they were family, they had their own issues. Also, the pressures within the family were tense at times. I felt I was just one more problem, and at times I'm sure I was a channel for some of their frustrations. This was a low point for me. I was very down. When you can't get away from your problems, sometimes you try to hide from them. I soon discovered a way to hide, and I found refuge from the feeling of abandonment and worthlessness. I began dabbling in drinking and smoking hash. It was an escape. It dulled down the emotions that I was going through. The end result was I began missing school, which led to further isolation. I used to sleep a lot and dream of a life that wasn't like the one I was trapped in. Then I would wake up and realise that I wasn't wanted. I felt so alone. My auntie fell pregnant and there was no room, at least not for me. So social services were phoned and again I was moved on. Although at this point I knew I was going to be going to strangers, I remember thinking it would be good to get away. Maybe the family would be okay and I would get looked after. By this point, I needed clothes, shoes and some kind of support, any kind of support. Moving in with my foster parents was okay and the house was nice. Before long, things went downhill. The food made for me was cheap and nasty and I had the feeling that any money she got from me was not being spent on what it should have been. I had nothing and this was reflected in my view of myself. I felt like I was at the bottom of the pile, looked down on at school. When you're a teenager, you're judged on by your clothes, your trainers, and because I had no money to buy big brands, I was singled out and made fun of. I couldn't take it anymore, so I stopped going to school and I found a familiar solace in drinking smoking hash to try to block the reality of the situation. Things came to a head when my foster parent caught me in my room smoking a fag. Usually she didn't bother that much, but that day she was very angry. She grabbed me and I could feel nails tearing into my skin, so I pushed her to get her off me. I ran to my room and turned my stereo on full blast, knowing full well that the social services would be called. My next home was the worst yet. It was dirty and untidy to the point I felt unclean. My carer showed favouritism to her own children over the foster kids so blatantly that I knew full well that she was only doing it for the money and care was not on her agenda. I can remember arguments where my mum had been paying her money, child benefit I think, and she denied it. My mum had to pay it back even though she had given it to my carer. One day I came back to find her boyfriend smoking smack. I told my social worker I wanted out, but as she wanted me to explain to my carer the reasons why, I froze and said nothing. I remember she would spend a lot of time in the bathroom and one day I found lots of tinfoil hidden in the cupboard. Assuming that she too was on smack, I didn't know what to do. I stayed because at this stage I had started seeing a boy and was staying at his a lot. I came back to my carer's house one day one of her friends started an argument with me and it became violent. My carer wanted me out, the social worker was my only hope. They said there were no other carers available to take me. I asked if I could stay with my boyfriend until one came up. The social worker said that would be fine but I would have to sign a disclaimer, which I did. I did not find out until later that I had signed myself out of care. She hadn't made me aware that this was the case, again I had been dumped. I had no option now but to stay with my boyfriend even though I hadn't known him for that long but I had no choice. I became homeless due to eviction. My boyfriend, as far as I knew, was meant to be paying bills and rent. I was giving him half the money to pay towards these, but he didn't pay any of them. He was hiding letters from the council and reminders from the gas and electric companies. Then I found out he was cheating. I put him out and changed the locks. What was already a difficult situation turned worse when I found the letters he had been hiding and realised that nothing had been getting paid. As more came through the post, I became aware that the situation was far beyond repair. As a long period of time had passed, I knew that by this time there would be no way I could pay the amount of money that they wanted straight away, and in reality, I would severely struggle to pay it off anyway. Although I got some help from trading standards, it was still too late to repair the damage, so it came that I was evicted. As my relationship with my mother had broken down a long time ago, I knew that asking her for help was not an option, so I stayed at a mate's for a few months. The humiliation I had already suffered at the hands of my ex was bad enough. Now I was homeless, unemployed and depressed. I decided to go to my auntie's and as I had a permanent address I was able to get a job. 
but as my family suffered a bereavement, I took a bit of time off and was sacked. Due to the bereavement within the family, it became more difficult for me to stay at my aunt's, so I moved out and was given a place at Valley Gardens, Kirkcaldy, where I stayed for a month or two. Then I was given a homeless flat at Westbridge Halls, Link Living, and as at the time I had a car, I didn't mind being so far away from family and friends. I had started a relationship with a guy and quickly moved in, hoping that I could settle, but this relationship turned sour, so I moved out and in with a friend. This was okay, but it was a small flat, and as my friend had started a new relationship, it soon became overcrowded. I moved back with my uncle, as by this point my options were severely limited. But again, he had his own issues. Depressed and manipulating, he got into the habit of using me to take out his frustrations. I began to realise that he was going into my room when I wasn't there and taking things, and I wondered what else he was going through. I felt like a money-making machine, and even when I had paid rent, he would ask for it again. Arguing against this was fruitless as they could always say, no money, no room. After everything, the care, the family and the rejection I had suffered along the way, I decided that enough was enough. I needed to get myself sorted for good and I called the emergency homeless phone number. I managed to get a place at Gilvin House and that is where I am now. This is the first time in a long time I have felt like I can get out of the cycle of homelessness and finally get back on the road to a place of my own. It has been good here, and as I'm shown that I can live independently, I'm soon going to be getting a scatter flat, which will lead to my very own tenancy and a home of my own. I am working and have done through most of my journey. I believe I'm working for what you want, but in the hostel it seems you're punished for it. Out of my wages, I have to pay £90 per week to the hostel, which reinforces the viewpoint of many homeless people of what is the point in working. I still need to live, bus fares, and I still have my dog who resides at my mum's. I know that the system at Gilvin has and will be positive for me now and in the future, but there are still things that could be improved upon. It has been a very difficult journey, but at this point I'm confident things can get better. They have to.